How are Christians to relate in the unbelieving world? Peter has reminded us of the relationship we have with God in Christ. He's reminded us how we are to relate to one another in the community of Christ. And now in this new section, which begins in chapter 2, uh, verse 12, through chapter 3, uh, verse 12, he's dealing with how we relate to the secular society. It's very difficult, isn't it, to be an authentic Christian in this world? There's all kinds of challenges, but that is our theme now. And our relationship with the world, this is very important, begins with a deep realization that we don't really belong to it. Peter has described us as a couple of times as sojourners and exiles. We are pilgrims passing through to celestial city. Therefore, he said, as we saw last week, abstain from the passions of the flesh. Her home is in heaven. Soon all of us will say farewell to this world and be forever with the Lord. So in a sense, as we live this world, uh, we're homeless. Jesus says you're in the world, but you're not of it. But an understanding of this crucial truth gives us tremendous freedom. Peter is quick to explain that this abstinence from the passions of the flesh that we saw last time does not mean that we live isolated or insulated lives from this world. We don't lock ourselves away from the world to avoid criticism and persecution to make life easy for ourselves. No, we are to shine Christ's light, one of our themes, to, themes this year. We are to shine Christ's light and so illuminate the darkness. And as we live in this world, as we'll see today, we have positive responsibilities in the world. We are to live in this world as good citizens. Christians are to be good citizens. We're not to be rebels. How are we to relate to this world? Well, in chapter 2, verse 12, we learned last time that we are to demonstrate good deeds before unbelievers. Now, our good deeds don't save us. We're saved by grace alone. It's all of the Father's initiative who sees our condition as sinners and sends His Son to save us and to redeem us. But now that we are redeemed, now that we have been saved by grace, we are to demonstrate the transformation in our lives by living good lives. I challenged you last week Would people say that you are a good person. Now, in the passage we're going to read together, Peter gives three commands which will help us to live as citizens in a secular society. So, let's stand and read the Scriptures this morning, as it's found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Now, this is the Word of God to us. Let's read it. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, let's look at the first command, which is found in verses 13 through 15. If you have your Bibles, please op open them. First Peter chapter 2. And in verses 13 through 15, Peter is telling us to submit to secular governments. In fact, submission is to be the lifestyle of the Christian. We live in an anti-authority age. Postmodernism rejects authority and is hostile to it. No one is going to tell me what to do, is that is the theme of today. Our favorite song, often sung at funerals, is, I did it my way. Not the song 
we should sing at a Christian's funeral. I did it my way. That may be the mood of society, but it's not the mandate of Scripture. Now, none of us likes to submit. Peter and his readers, let me remind you, lived in a very difficult world where it was not easy to submit. But the Christian, the follower of Jesus Christ, is not to be characterized by power-seeking or pleasure-seeking, but rather by a gracious and humble submission to serve others. That's the Spirit of Christ. Remember, Paul says in Romans 15, for even Christ did not please Himself. Now, this word that we see in verse 13, be subject to the Lord, is the key word in this section. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Verse 18, servants, be subject, same word, to your master with all respect. We'll think of that next week, Lord willing. Chapter 3, verse 1, likewise, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. A repetition of the same Greek word. It is a command. Submission is part of the lifestyle of the Christian. Paul says in Ephesians 5 that those who are filled with the Spirit will be characterized by this, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You want to be filled with the Spirit? Submit to others out of a reverence for Christ. This is God's will. First of all, of course, when we think of the subject of submission or subjection, we must submit first to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Do you acknowledge the authority of Christ in your life? Matthew 28, he says, all power, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. There's no one higher. We began with our choir singing, all hail the power of Jesus' name. He's the highest. There is no one higher. There is no one greater. There is no appeal court. If you don't like what Jesus is saying, He is supreme. He is Lord. He's not only Jesus, He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we who are His followers must submit to His will and His Word. So the question I ask you today, do you acknowledge the Lord Jesus absolute rule over your life? Have you surrendered everything you are and everything you have to the Lord Jesus? You say, John, that, that, that's quite a claim, isn't it? Yes, it is. All I have, all I am is yours, Lord. You are the Lord of my life. I have to submit to you. We must submit to Him and obey Him. That's what it means to be an authentic Christian. So I ask you, is that true in your life? That's where submission starts. So first, we must submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Secondly, we are to submit in our families. Uh, we see that in chapter 3 and following. Wives are to submit to their husbands. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Children you listening, children, students? You are to submit to your parents and obey them, Ephesians 6, verses 1 and 2. Submission in the family. Wouldn't that transform families if we submitted to one another? If men led their families, if children submitted, if husbands cared for their wives and loved them as Christ loved the church? First, submission to the Lordship of Christ. Secondly, submit in your families. Third, we are to submit in the church. It is the Holy Spirit who raises up overseers in the church of God. We are to submit to the leaders of the church. Listen to the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give, will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. 
as you submit to your leaders, there is joy. If you don't do, there's a lot of groan, groan, groaning, a lot of division, a lot of carnality, but we are to submit to the leaders in the church. God raises them up. God calls us to that position. So here at Calvary, we are to submit to the elders and pastors. You say, well, I'm not sure about that. I understand that. Sometimes you think you are wiser than they are, and sometimes that may be the case. Sometimes you may do things a little differently, but you are humbly to submit to those that the Holy Spirit raises in the church. Next week, we'll learn that we are to submit to our employers and our supervisors. But now, as we look at verses 13 through 15, Peter is saying, we are to submit to all levels of the secular government's authority. Be subject, verse 13, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Do you hear this? We are to submit to the secular government as it is ordained and established by God. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. To resist the governing authority, then, is to resist God. Emperors, they are the emperor at the time. Uh, really, the word is for the king. Uh, we might say the president, those who are the highest in the government, and governors as sent by him, we are to submit to them for the well-being of society. We're to submit to the king. We don't have a king. We're to submit as a then to the president and the governors, to those in high authority is the point. Now, at this time, first century readers reading this, the emperor was either Claudius or Nero. They were the Roman emperor at the time, nasty kind of individuals. Nero blamed the Christians for the fire in Rome, you may recall. He dressed Christians with skins of wild beasts, and then they were ravaged to death by wild dogs. Think of that. Others were crucified, and their bodies torched to light up the night sky. Not easy being a Christian in the first century. And now Peter is saying you are to submit to the emperor. We here, living in the 21st century, have it much easier, don't we? We must be good citizens. We must submit to all levels of authority, federal, state, and local. We are sojourners and aliens, chapter 2, verse 11. But our key motivation, did you notice verse 13? We do this for the Lord's sake. Verse 15, this, for this is the will of God. God is pleased when we have submission, submissive attitudes to authority. You ever been stopped by a state trooper for speeding? In God's grace, I haven't. What are you to do? If you don't like it, you are to submit. Follow his instructions. He may decide not to write you a ticket. A slight chance. But submit. Police officer gives instructions. Follow them. Obey them. God has put them in a position of authority. Dislike of and disagreement with the government are not reasons for disobedience. We as good citizens, you listening? Pay your taxes. Obey government regulations. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, our Savior says, and to God the things that are God's. You say, I enjoy giving money to the Lord at Calvary. I don't love paying my taxes. I understand that. But as a good citizen, for the Lord's sake, this is the will of God. Don't cheat on your taxes. That's a form of theft. The Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal. You're getting ready to do your taxes? 
be honest. The IRS is set there as a governing authority. We are ordained by God. We are to submit to the secular laws. I remember a client of mine, he had caught a magnificent salmon, about this size. As you told the story, it was that size, but it was about this size. Beautiful fish. But as I talked to him, it was obvious, he had poached the salmon. There are regulations about catching salmon, and he had breached them. He was quite proud that he had got this salmon. And I said to him, you know, the Eighth Commandment says, thou shalt not steal. You have stolen that salmon. He said, well, I go by the Eleventh Commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> Funny, but not what we should do. Submission to the secular government is a good Christian testimony. Students, comply with all of the rules at your school. You may think they are petty. You may want to rebel. You are to submit to them. I remember when I was a senior at high school, 18 years old, we think we're a man, and we had to wear school uniform. And uh, one day I decided, instead of wearing the school tie, uh, to wear my own tie. I love ties. Some of you think I go to bed with my tie on, but I do take it off. So I like ties. And uh, the principal, under the head of the school, who was a woman of great authority and passion, she saw me. Monroe, she put her little finger. Yes, miss. What kind of tie is this? I said, it's my tie. Wear the school tie. Next day, I had the school tie on. I also had a little button, Jesus saves. <laughs> Good to put on a little button, Jesus saves, but obey the regulations of the school. We may think they're silly. We may think they're bureaucratic. Such submis submission, says uh, Peter, will silence the ignorance of foolish people. Instead of being a rabble rouser, instead of being a rebel, we are to do good. Are you known for doing good, I ask you? What about your speech? Is it hateful speech, rhetoric? I said last week about the rhetoric even coming from Christians, slander, nasty comments on social media. The Christian is not to be like that. It's one thing to shout against an abortion, and we are against abortion. It's another thing to adopt or foster an unwanted child. That's doing good. One thing to say, I oppose abortion. It's another thing to volunteer at the pregnancy center. It's one thing to say, uh, these children in the womb are created by God. That's true. But it's another thing to teach children in the good news clubs. That's doing good. Christians must not re resort to violence, abuse, name-calling, when they disagree with the law. Unbelievers are closely watching you. Let's do good. We saw that last week. Chapter 2, verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of vis visitation. Verse 15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Are you known? Again, I ask you, that I think this is so important and often ignored by authentic Christians. Are you doing good. Now, Peter, who's writing these verses, also said in Acts 5, verse 29, we must obey God rather than man. That's true. There's a time when we disobey the law. Civil disobedience is appropriate when the government passes a law in direct opposition to a specific command from God. We are to disobey it. We are to obey God rather than man. But in civil disobedience, the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but are divinely powerful. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, we are to be exemplary citizens, not rebels, not disrespectful of our rulers. We are to be known for doing good. That's the first command, submit to secular 
governments. Do you find that oppressive? Well, here's the second command. Use your freedom responsibly. Verse 16, we sang about this freedom. Live as, isn't this wonderful? In the midst of this, Peter says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. As authentic believers, we're not to feel that we're oppressed. These first leaders, first century uh, readers were persecuted, sent from their home. But Peter is saying, and the Holy Spirit is saying to us, live as free people. Remember Paul in Galatians 5, for freedom Christ has set us free. We are redeemed. We are ransomed, Peter has said in chapter 1. We are redeemed from the bondage of sin and death by the blood of the Lamb. We've been set free, even though we may be under unjust laws and ungodly rulers, we as the people of God are free. Living a life of submission is not inconsistent with being free. While we do submit to the secular government, that government is never our master. The Lord Jesus Christ is our supreme master. He owns my total obedience. We are free, but notice what Peter says in verse 15, but you live as servants of God. In fact, the word is slaves. How can I be a slave and free? Here it is. In doing God's will, you are truly free. I want you to understand that. In doing the will of God, we are truly free. And we are to use our freedom that we have to serve God and others. Peter says, verse 16, don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil, like my friend who caught the, the fish. No, he thinks I'm free. God made the fish, who is the government, to tell me what I can't and can't do. No, don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Don't use it as an excuse for submitting to secular laws or causing trouble. Don't use your freedom for self-indulgence, but use it to serve others. Paul says the same thing in Galatians 5, verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. No, we're not free to live any way we want as Christians. We are free to please God and serve others. Here's one of the paradoxes of the Christian life. We are slaves of God, but we're free. A fish is free as long as it's in water. If it swims about, take that fish out of water, put it in a different environment, and it's going to die. Our environment that we live in is the Christian life. Jesus put it this way, whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Try to live your own way, and you'll lose it. Freedom, full fulfillment, and joy come, and some of you know this, come from living for the glory of God. God is our creator. God knows what makes us joyful and sad. I'm to follow Him. I'm to obey Him. My obedience to Christ produces great freedom. Disobedience brings bondage and spiritual slavery. You're in bondage, bondage to your fears, bondage to your worries, and bondage to your sin and your guilt and your shame. Christ wants us to be free, free in Christ. You've been set free from the chains of your sin. I'm now free. I'm a slave of God, but I'm free, and my greatest joy is in obeying and pleasing my Savior. And one of the ways we demonstrate our freedom is by showing respect. The gospel produces, as we're going to see, respect for others. First command, submit to the secular government. 
Command number two, use your freedom responsibly. Command number three, honor others, respect others. Look at verse 17. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Christians are not only to honor the emperor, the king, but everyone. The same Greek word, tamao, is used twice in 17. It's the same word, honor everyone. That word honor is the same word used for honor the emperor, to respect the emperor, but I'm to respect everyone. All races, people of a different color of skin from me, different nationalities, different cultures, different people, the homeless, those in the margins of life, as well as the successful people. I'm to honor, I'm to respect everyone, particularly those who are different from me. All are made in the image of God. Now, I love The Economist, the magazine, and it has brilliant obituaries. And so, when I get my copy of The Economist, the first thing I do is to turn to the back and I read obituaries. You think, that's a strange thing to do. Well, I'm a pastor. I deal with death. I hear people describing people uh, at funerals, and I like to read obituaries. They, are, they have brilliant writers in The Economist, and uh, I read this one. So much of what I read is quoted from The Economist. <clears throat> On December 30, age 92, Elmore Nickelberry died. Some of you know this story. It was new to me. He was one of the last striking sanitation workers of Memphis. In April 1968, Elmore Nickelberry was one of 1,300 in the city of Memphis who had gone on strike. Every morning, Elmore would get up at 7 a.m., walk two miles to the depot, and spend his days hefting tubs in and out of people's backyards. A garbage collector, sanitation. The tubs, loaded with loose waste, were heavy, so he didn't have much choice but to put them on his head. They were old and leaky, so maggots and foul stuff ran down his face. The sanitation workers were given no overshoes, no uniforms or rain suits, and could not use the, de the depot's bathroom or the shower because they were black men. This is only 1968. By the end of the day, Elmore stank so badly he couldn't ride the bus. In 1968, his pay was $1.65 hour, 65 an hour for a nine-hour day, $1.68 an hour. At the first strike march, the, people, the police yelled, get off the sidewalk, get off the sidewalk, boy. It was that word, boy, that hurt him more than anything. Do this, boy. Over here, boy, as a sanitation worker, he also heard, hey, garbage man, as if he was garbage himself. A young man thought up a slogan for the strikers that simply said, I am a man. There it is, part of American history. They marched silently in a single file, just holding up that message, I am a man. Martin Luther King came to support the strike at linked arms at the head of a march. The world's eyes turned to Memphis. Within a month, the city agreed to give Mr. Nickelberry and the others a fair amount of what they had been asking. He got 15 cents more an hour. He got shoes, uniforms, and was allowed to use the depot bathroom. He never forgot that Dr. King had come from out of town to fight for them. Thanks to him, the kicked around boys had become men. And more than men, because with him, they had climbed a mountain and glimpsed the promised land. Amazing story, isn't it? Human beings treating other human beings in their own country with deep, deep respect. The Scripture says in my Bible, verse 17, honor everyone. We are to respect and honor everyone. 
as I say, our respect for those in authority has decreased. Very tough, for example, being a police officer now because of the disrespect given to them when they're trying to uphold the law. What, but what does the Bible say? Honor everyone. I am to respect everyone. That's it. No debate, no exceptions. I'm not only to honor the emperor, the president, the prime minister, the leader, the king. I'm to honor everyone, including those who are different from myself. Honor everyone. That's quite a challenge. We're not to slander people. We're not to put them down. We're not to be vengeful or hateful, or, but respectful to everyone. Christians should be characterized by gracious, courteous, kind behavior and speech to everyone. We should have good manners. We're to honor everyone. Now, I read this. I was very convicted because sometimes I ignore people. I pass them by. They're not my type of person, as it were. Honor everyone. Do you respect everyone who comes to Calvary Church? Someone who's different from you, different nationality? Respect everyone. Also, says Peter, honor the emperor. Claudius and Nero, the Roman emperors, persecuted Christians. Very difficult to be a Christian. You would lose your job. You had to move sometimes. You could be imprisoned. You could be stoned. You could be killed. I am to honor a corrupt, immoral, and idolatrous emperor. We, as Americans, Christians, we must honor the president, honor Congress, honor our governor, our mayor, honor judges, honor law enforcement officers, even when we disagree with them. We should not, according to this verse, some of you may disagree with me, but I think it's clear in Scripture, we should not speak disrespectfully of the president or the former president. They may speak disrespectfully of each other. They may engage in rhetoric, but that's not the way of Christians. We're to honor our senators. We're to honor our congressmen. We sometimes wonder what they do. We sometimes don't agree with their laws, but we are to honor them. Here they were to honor the emperor, a pagan, cruel, and immoral man. No, we don't honor him. We don't obey him when what they say conflicts with Scripture. But when I honor God, I'm honoring others. Now, there's a challenge for you this week. You show respect to everyone you meet in your office, your bank, the hospital, the factory, the store, the community. Do you, do you, do you honor people? Do you honor that waitress that comes to you? Do you honor someone you meet casually? Do you treat them with respect? That's what Scripture says. I can't imagine being like this man in Memphis and people showing such disrespect of being treated so badly because of the color of my skin. I've never experienced that. Some of you may have. Some of you don't like Scotsmen. I don't like Irishmen. That's why I'm glad there's not too much green out there. <laughs> Particularly when they beat us at rugby yesterday. Not by much, but they beat us. Um, I am to respect an Irishman. <laughs> I am to respect people from other countries. Do you do that? But notice also how beautifully... In the middle of this, Peter says, love the brotherhood. One of our themes for this year is love one another. I challenge you. I challenge myself. Love one another. Love the brotherhood. We have a special love, an agape love for one another. We saw that in chapter 1, verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. He's talking to authentic Christians. For a sincere, brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. It's to be sincere. It's not to be hypocritical. 
It's to love people earnestly and to do that from a pure heart, not with a hidden agenda, not to manipulate someone, but I'm to do it genuinely and sincerely. Why? They are my fellow brothers and sisters. We love one another. It's wonderful when I hear people say, as they come to Calvary, it's like they have felt that warmth and that love. I trust that you, that is your experience. Here at Calvary, we, we are to love one another. I know we have some difficult personalities. I know we have some odd people like myself and you, but we are to love one another. What a beautiful environment is created, isn't it? In your life group, as you go in, you feel loved and cared for. What a wonderful thing if you sing in the choir and you feel that love from your brothers and sisters. What a wonderful thing as you gathered around nine o'clock as an usher or a greeter to meet with Malcolm to get your instructions and you feel the love of your brothers and sisters. When you come into the sanctuary, as you're worshiping God, yes, it's primarily a relationship with God, but we're worshiping together and we feel the love of the brothers and sisters around us. Love openly. Proverbs tells us that love that is hidden is worthless. Love openly as long as you can do it with sincerity, do it with a pure heart. I ask you, I ask you, do you think we could do this at Calvary Church? Some of you have come from churches which have been divided, where people have said nasty things to each other, where people have treated each other with disrespect. Yes, we're going to have some differences. Of course we are. Yes, you're not going to be pleased with everything that we do at Calvary Church. That is true. But we are commanded in Scripture to love the brotherhood. Could you do that? Reach out to someone. Show them love. Many of you do that. Taking meals to those in their home. Making a phone call. Encouraging one another. Giving someone who's discouraged a hug. Reminder that you are loved. Not only by God, but loved by one another. There's a last one, isn't there? We are to fear God. I am to fear God. The emperor is to be honored, that's true, but only God is to be feared. I don't fear the president. I don't fear a police officer. I am to fear God. The ultimate authority is not the emperor, but is our Lord Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, who has supreme authority. Peter says in chapter 3, verse 22, regarding our Savior who's gone through the resurrection, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to Him. Same word, subject. They are subject to Him. All of the authorities, all of the angels, all of the powers are under His mighty hand. Therefore, I am to fear God. And reverence and all. We use the word awesome. We trivialize it to refer it to an ice cream or something. But God truly is awesome. And having a sense of the greatness of God and the power of God and the love of God produces in us a fear, a reverence, yes, a joyful reverence, and that is a great motivation to live a godly life. The fear of the Lord, says Solomon, is the beginning of wisdom. You want wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And fearing God motivates us to honor and respect others because they're made in the image of God. How are we to relate to the unbelieving world? According to verses 13 through 17, four ways. Submit to those in authority. Do you hear me? Do good deeds. Use your freedom responsibly, but rejoice in your freedom. 
Don't allow anyone or anything to put you back into bondage. Celebrate the freedom that you have in Christ and honor people. A quiet, godly, winsome, good, respectful conduct is the key. Yes, even in the face of opposition and ridicule. Wherever you are, in all circumstances, live that the world sees in you a difference. That the world realizes that you are a different kind of person, and you are a good person, and you are a respectful person. And when treated badly, Peter is going to say, whether it's in society, whether it's at your work, when treated badly, your godly attitude and conduct will have a profound impact on people. Our goal as Christians is not primarily to change society. Our goal is to display and proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ, starting in your home, your work here at Calvary, whatever you do in all circumstances, particularly difficult circumstances. I am to display and proclaim my Lord Jesus Christ, because my permanent home, <laughs> the kingdom isn't here. And we eagerly anticipate, don't we, that great day when every existential contradiction will be resolved and our Lord Jesus Christ will return with power and glory. And as the world looks on, Jesus said, Matthew 5, verse 16, let your light shine before you in such a way that they may see your good deeds and glorify God in heaven. May that be true of us at Calvary Church, that we will shine Christ's light, that we will love one another. And as people come onto this campus and as we go into society, that will be a powerful apologetic that Christianity does make a difference, even in the midst of difficulties, even in the problems of life, we will continue to look to our Savior who is soon coming. But do you know Him? Some of you here have never yet been freed from your sin and your shame and your guilt. It means that you come to the cross of Christ. Peter has already explained, this perfect Lamb whose blood was shed, that you, whatever your condition, whatever you've done, may repent and look to Christ for salvation and transformation and true freedom. Our Father and our God, we humble ourselves. This has been very convicting for us. We confess we sometimes don't show respect to one another. Sometimes we don't submit to the secular authorities. Forgive us, Father. I pray for each one here that they will shine with the beauty of Christ, that we'll be kind and respectful in our conduct so that people may see our good deeds and glorify You in heaven. For those who have never experienced this wonderful freedom in Christ, may they repent and look to Christ and so be saved. We ask it in His name. Amen.